Hello and welcome to the Of Interest podcast. I'm Gareth Vaughan from interest.co.nz. Inflation, running at its highest level since 1990, has been a big story over the past year, with Statistics New Zealand's Consumers Price Index, or CPI, running above 7% for three consecutive quarters now, the Reserve Bank, which is tasked with keeping it between 1% and 3%, has been aggressively increasing its official cash rate, with that flowing through to bank interest rates for borrowers and savers. The CPI is a measure of inflation for New Zealand households. It records changes in the price of goods and services. On top of impacting interest rates, the CPI influences wage negotiations and is used to adjust New Zealand superannuation rates and welfare payments too. So given the CPI's importance, just what's in it, how is this determined, and do we have the settings and frequency of the CPI right? To discuss this, I'm joined by Bill Rosenberg. Bill is the former policy director and economist at the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions. He's now a commissioner of the New Zealand Productivity Commission and a senior associate at Victoria University's Institute for Governance and Policy Studies. Ten years ago, Bill was also one of nine people Statistics New Zealand appointed to a committee to independently review the methods and practices used to compile the CPI and to advise the government statistician on the CPI. Hi, Bill, and welcome to the Of Interest podcast. It's great to have you with us. Hi, Gareth, and great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I thought it would be quite interesting just to sort of begin with um, to just hear just how much importance you place on the CPI. Um, I mean, I'm thinking here in in particular in terms of its ranking of importance among the key economic data that uh, is monitored, Uh, because certainly at the moment in the high inflationary environment that that I've outlined, it does feel like it's the most important piece of economic data that we wait on. Um, So so how much importance do you place on it? Yeah, it's certainly one of the most important. It's got a special status amongst our statistical series and that it goes, it's, it's by far the oldest, it goes back to 1914 and, and, and has changed in various forms, but it's been around for a long time. And it's, as you've said in your introduction, important in giving people a way of judging their, their cost of living, um, which is obviously important, an important ingredient in people's living standards and the quality of life. Um, it's used, as you said, in, in adjusting many government payments um, and wage, wage increases are frequently based on it. Um, and of course, the Reserve Bank uses it, as, as we'll doubtless discuss. Um, so it's got practical bread and butter, um, to use the current phrase, um, implications, as well as being important in government policy. We actually have some other similar series um, for for prices for, for business prices and perhaps most importantly in this context the relatively new household living cost price index which is actually a better measure for um, living costs than the CPI but the CPI is still important. Yeah, and I mean I guess the fact that the CPI is so important to the Reserve Bank that magnifies its um, its. Focus, the focus we have on it, I guess. Um, so just in terms of, of how it is put together, I mean, you know, Statistics New Zealand obviously puts quite a bit of effort into um, putting it together, collecting a, around 100,000 prices every quarter. Um, c- can you give us a sort of a rundown on, on how they go about doing this? Yeah, sure. So it's important to get a few concepts um, that they use in compiling this index. And an index measures not the level of prices, but how they change. And the CPI use, measures the change in prices of goods and services that people resident in New Zealand buy for their own use. Uh, so it doesn't include things like steel ingots or business services, which are inputs into business. Um, it is based on the idea that people's spending, and this is quite important, that people's spending can be represented by a single average household, which buys in various quantities, everything that households around New Zealand buy at some point, with a few notable exceptions that I think we'll come back to. So this average household buys everything from apples and restaurant meals, 
through to uh, bus rides and overseas trips. Uh, these goods and services, are, this collection of goods and services is known as the basket of goods bought by this average household. Uh, and to combine it, combine it, they need two essential pieces of information, two main kinds of information. Firstly, they obviously need to know the prices of the over 700 goods and services in this basket. Um, and they do that uh, uh, right around the country. But secondly, and just as importantly, they need to know how much of each of them the average household buys. In other words, what the weight they're given in the index. It's no point in giving caviar the same weight as rent, for example, because caviar is a tiny proportion of household expenditure, and it's not, not even an index, it's so small, um, whereas rent is obviously very big. So where do they get the prices from? They actually go out to, to retail outlets, shops, supermarkets, and so on, in 12 different centres around New Zealand, and they look at the prices on the shelves. Actually, that's changing because increasingly they're making use of electronic sources uh, from the checkout tills and scraping websites, um, which is not only more efficient, but it gives them much more accurate pricing um, of what people are actually paying and potentially much more frequent updates on these price changes. Um, they also survey businesses and use administrative sources such as the bond data, database for rents. For those weights, for those expenditure weights, they mainly rely on a three yearly household expenditure survey, uh, which asks households to record what they spend. There's some quirks in this survey. For example, people apparently under, <coughs> excuse me, under report what they spend on clothing and on alcohol and tobacco. Um, so other sources are used to check the results and adjust them if needed. At the extreme, for reasons you can guess at, they don't include, um, people don't report very accurately their spending on prostitution, and illegal drugs and gambling, uh, which really should be in the index, but um, they omit because they just can't get information on it. Yeah, it could be slightly harder to collect all that information. It <laughs> could be. <laughs> yeah. Um, Look, I mean, it's, it's interesting to look at how it's done. Um, and, and I mean, just in terms of um, the, you know, collecting it in different regions of the country, is, is the index itself weighted towards regions with bigger populations or higher spending levels? I mean, how do they account for that type of thing? Yeah, so it's, as I mentioned, it's collected over 12 different collection areas. Um, so obviously the excuse me, the main centres plus some of the provincial centres. Um, and it's actually weighted by expenditure. So um, the, um, you know, Auckland would get much higher weighting for that reason than um, uh, than one of the other centres. And um, there's some, you know, it's worth thinking about what that means because it does mean that higher spending areas, wealthier areas might get a, a bigger weighting than than lower income areas. Um, but by and large, having those 12 works out reasonably well because they did some testing. It used to be 15. Um, I think it used to be more than that before. And what they found was adding or subtracting um, some of those centres actually made very little difference to the actual results that they got. And obviously, you know, you've, you've already noted some of the things that are in there. There's a huge range of different items that people, um, goods and services that people spend money on, and they have the groupings or the categories of food, obviously, clothing and footwear, you know, household items, health, transport, recreation, uh, communication, accommodation services, education, miscellaneous goods and services, insurance, credit services, um, I'm just wondering, uh, if, from your perspective, is there any obvious thing that's missing in terms of the, a category or maybe some very important individual item or items that you think perhaps should be in there or could be in there that isn't? The, the, the most glaring ones are in the areas of housing and interest payments. So interest, interest is not in the CPI, and that's because this index is designed for the Reserve Bank. And the Reserve Bank obviously sets interest rates or, or sets its, um, its um, 
uh, official interest rate, which other interest rates tend to, to follow. And it quite under, understandably says that if the CPI went up, when interest rates went up, then we'll be kind of chasing our own tails. So it would be circularity in, in the um, measurement. On the other hand, of course, interest rates are really a significant cost to many households. And um, so to that extent, it doesn't represent what people actually um, see in their outgoings when they're, when they're um, looking at their day-to-day -day expenses. Um, so that's a significant issue. And it's one of the ones that has been remedied in that household living cost price index that does include um, mortgage payments, for example, and that kind of thing. The other thing that um, is not in there, and it's a, a, a more difficult one in many ways, is housing um, itself in the sense of houses that you buy from another person, existing houses. Um, it does have um, the cost of buying a new house, excluding land. So land is not in the, the cost of land is not in the index which is actually the, the part of a property that you buy that goes up in price the most. Um, but there's nothing for existing housing. Um, and this is a, a, a difficult conceptual point, really, and, and different countries address it in different ways. Um, but none of them, I think, really reflect what people see in terms of the increasing unaffordability of buying existing housing. Um, and so, for example, the um, United States uses what uh, uses a, an imputed rent. In other words, what would be the rent you would pay for the house that you own if you were to pay a landlord for it? Um, but even that really only shows what rents are doing, not what house prices are doing, and and the two can diverge quite significantly. So this is kind of an un, a, a problem that. Um, hasn't really been well solved and uh, people need to bear in mind when they're looking at the CPI. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I note that housing rentals are in the CPI and as you've said, buying newly constructed houses, excluding the land is in there. But if I, if you sell me your house, that's not in there. Um, and also your point around um, interest payments is very interesting because obviously in a rising interest rate environment, if if I have a mortgage and I have to refix it, that's a significantly increased cost to me. So, I mean, how big of a problem do you think it is that we don't have these in there? You mentioned the household living cost price index. So, I mean, I guess for the Reserve Bank's purpose, you're saying that having, not having interest payments in there maybe is, is not a, in fact, is probably a good thing. But not having those house sales in there, is, is that a, a, a big issue? I, I think it is, and, and this was debated in, in that advisory committee that you mentioned, um, and Reserve Bank won. <laughs> um, I think if I was doing it again, I would push back more on that because I do think it's misleading um, for you know for ordinary people, and I think the Reserve Bank, you know, has more than capability to subtract out that interest payments and and have its target expressed in in terms of. CPI minus uh, interest payments, and and it, at various periods, it has that's the way it has done it. It's had a, its own CPX index that excluded uh, interest payments. There, there come back to that is to say that that makes for confusion amongst the public that you know that they see CPI and the Reserve Bank is targeting something different. Um, I, I, I think that um, the integrity of the CPI is probably more important. But if we can't get past that, I do I do think once again that people should rely more on the household living cost price index to look at what, um, you know, what to have a better indication of, of how costs are changing for them. And how, how often does that come out and what has that been telling us in recent times? So that's, uh, again, quarterly. It comes out a week after the CPI. Um, and it shows, for example, that um, inflation rather than around seven, to, just over seven percent, it is more like eight percent when you look at all households. Um, so comparing like with like, if you if you like, 
how the, one of the important part, aspects of it is that it has different household, has inflation from different households. So it's got inflation, it's got indexes for the lowest income households, the highest income households. So if five different types of households and that's it, in those different income ranges. Similarly for expend, the, the expenditure of those households. So the lowest spending household and the highest spending. Um, it's got ones for superannuitants, for beneficiaries, for Māori households. So, um, and the, and what we saw is only being uh, published for the years from 2008 onwards. And what we saw for, that, for most of that time was that low income households were experiencing, uh, and particularly low expenditure households, were exper experiencing much higher inflation than than high income and high income expenditure households. And that's because um, they spend much more on things like, uh, low income households spend much more on things like rent um, and food, which are going, which went up over that period much more quickly than the things that are more heavier weighted in high income households. And so for example, for most of the time until recently, interest rates have actually been dropping and interest rates because banks will only lend to high, higher income households, uh, interest rates rate much more highly in these expenditure patterns of those high income households. And they were therefore, um, their, their mortgage costs were actually falling, their interest costs were actually falling. So um, it's only, only in recent, very recent times, the last few quarters, that actually the higher income, higher expenditure households have experienced higher inflation in the low income households because of that rapid rise in, in interest rates. So just just to clarify, so in terms of the, the household living cost price index, so that has interest payments in there and house price house sales as well? So in terms of secondary market house sales? No, it doesn't, no. that no. doesn't have it either. Okay. And, and the reason they give for that is that, as you put it before, if I buy a house from you, um, because this is set up as one household, which represents which represents the average of all households, effectively, I am buying the house from myself within that household, if you can understand that. And so they say it doesn't make sense to have resales of houses in that. Now, I think, you know, I can see the logic in that, but it, it's it's kind of very counterintuitive for people when they go out there and and particularly for first homeowners, and they go out there and try buy a house and and just see how difficult it is. Yeah, so I mean it's really interesting sort of comparing the the CPI with the household living cost price index. I mean obviously as you've noted the CPI is really set up for the Reserve Bank, um, but but I mean as a measure of the inflation that is impacting New Zealand households. You appear to be saying that you think the household living cost price index is actually a better measure of that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's it's more representative of um, of the, the cost that people face, and and people can actually go to it and see. You know, roughly speaking, I'm middle income household. I can see how how my costs have been changing. Um, and it does deal better, as we've been saying, with uh, those interest costs. Yeah. One other area that I'm curious about is with either the CPI or the household living cost price index, in fact, um, does online shopping from an overseas website, does that get measured in this anywhere? Um, that was certainly discussed. I, I, to be honest, I'm not sure where they have got on that, whether they are measuring that or not. I did, uh, yeah, yeah, I did see that in the review in 2013, mm -hmm. the Reserve Bank was advocating for its inclusion, but mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen any suggestion that it has been included. Um, I mean, it potentially might be hard to measure, I would imagine. Yeah, it would be hard to measure because you'd have to know where which sites people go to and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so maybe that's uh, been the, the barrier. Yeah. Um, look, there, another key aspect is the frequency. So uh, uh, that this that this is that that uh, consumer price inflation is measured. Um, mm. Now, obviously, you're you're well aware of the fact that um, uh, 
New Zealand's an outlier in the OECD with every other OECD country now um, issuing CPI monthly and we still do this quarterly in New Zealand. Now, one of the recommendations from that advisory committee that you were part of was for monthly CPI. Now, that, that was obviously 10 years ago and nothing's changed on that front. So, I mean, do you, would you personally support a move to monthly CPI reporting and why or, or why not? Yeah, so I think the main reason they haven't done it is, is just cost, really, that um, it was going to cost about 1.3 million more to go to a, um, a monthly CPI. And the main advocate, again, for it was the, the Reserve Bank, who's saying can, the more information we've got and making our decisions, the better. The question there really is how much of a difference would it make? Um, there are big lags in monetary policy change. You know, when the, 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 it takes um, a year to 18 months for a change in interest in the Reserve Bank Reserve Bank's um, interest rate to work its way through into the economy. And and um, the impact's actually difficult to predict. I mean, in general terms, they can say this or that will happen, but as we've seen very recently, um, the in, the, in precise terms, it's quite difficult. And so the question is, having more precise monthly information, would that really make a difference? Uh, would, is New Zealand's performance on inflation uh, notably worse than other countries? And I think it's probably not. Um, and, uh, um, would, and does that additional monthly measurement which inevitably is susceptible to uh, changes that happen in the economy from time to time that are, you know, almost random. Things, strange things happen and which change prices and then write themselves and so on. And then there's measurement error, error as well. So there's the risk there that goes, uh, that we uh, take too much notice of the, the month to month fluctuations. Um, so I'm not I'm not convinced that um, spending money if we had a if the cost was not an object then perhaps it would be a good thing but I, I think there are higher priorities for statistics New Zealand to spend its money on. That's interesting because um, I mean one one point three million I guess it might be more today given that that price dates from yeah. ten years ago but in the in the context of overall um, I guess government expenditure. It's not a huge sum. It could probably be found if we really felt it was important enough. What what would you rather see StatsNZ do then? Well, there's a big lack of, of data on distribution of incomes and wealth and that kind of thing. There's um, We don't have good longitudinal data so, surveys, That's so that's over, you know, a, whole, a person's lifetime and intergenerational um, there's some big gaps in our national accounts, particularly around the areas of um, of assets and that kind of thing. Uh, in fact, Stats New Zealand has just published a, a, a document for consultation, asking for people's views on, you know, what what other work would they like them to do? What are their, their priorities? And there's a very long list there. So there are plenty of other things that um, Stats could usefully do. Just and back to the CPI, just in terms of how um, it measures tradable and non-tradable inflation. I mean, how important is the balance between them, and is it easy to get this right? I mean, just for the the the, the listeners um, here to remember that tradables are goods and services that are imported or that are in competition with foreign goods and services either in domestic or foreign markets, and non-tradables are goods and services that do not face foreign competition. Yeah, so um, about four, about uh, just under 60%, 59% of the index is non-tradables and 41% uh, is tradables. So it's tilted a bit towards non-tradables, to those more domestic uh, items. Um, so it's it's quite significant in a kind of macroeconomic sense, in that um, currently uh, inflation in 
non-tradables is 6.6%, or well, the latest in the December quarter, it was 6.6%, compared to 7.2% for the overall CPI. So it was lower than the overall CPI, whereas in, for the tradables, it was 8.2%. So um, we were importing a lot of inflation in that quarter and have been for the last uh, few quarters and a and, uh, year or so. Um, as a result of those supply chain um, barriers, uh, um, blockers, blockages, and um, the change in demand around the world. Um, so um, it's quite important to know both from the point of view of the Reserve Bank, because that imported inflation, they really can't do anything about. They can only, their, their monetary policy can only really affect the non-tradables. And um, it's led, for example, one uh, bank to one bank commentator to say that actually maybe we need to raise the interest rate target because we just, you know, short of really killing the economy, um, so that the uh, non-tradables go into the negative, the, the non-tradable inflation goes into the negative, which would be disastrous for a whole lot of reasons. Um, we, we're just going to have to take some of that internationally imported inflation uh, for, for as long as it lasts. Um, we can do something about the if the the fact that uh, there may well be uh, um, some of those people, those actual traders, uh, adding on their, you know, taking the opportunity to increase their margins, that kind of thing. We could work on that, but by and large, uh, we can't control that, that imported inflation. So um, this is a reversal of our historic trends from the you know, 2000s, say, where actually it was non-tradables, the domestic uh, market that was driving inflation. We had higher inflation in the non-tradables than in the tradables. And, um, and so thinking about those things really does make you think about both the structure of the economy, uh, reserve bank, monetary policy and a number of other things. Um, so yeah, it's worth thinking about them. I do make the point though that simply dividing it into non-tradables and tradables isn't the whole story because those non-tradables have a import content content that affects them. And equally the tradables have got a domestic content that affects them. Uh, yeah, that there's, there's more to it than some, and, and the definition of non-tradable and tradable is quite is quite um, uh, blurred too, so it's, it's not the whole story. But uh, there is there are important underlying issues there. The CPI is reviewed by Statistics New Zealand every three years, or albeit this year there's a delay of a year because they um, said that COVID nineteen related events have delayed their three year household economic survey um, in twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two. So we won't get the 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 review due this year won't happen until 2024. But anyway, the last review was in 2020, and they obviously they changed the weightings for some of the the groups of of goods and services in within the CPI. And I was interested just looking a little bit about how they did that in 2020. And one of the things that sort of jumped out at me was the weightings for fruit and vegetables and the the weighting for petrol were both decreased a little bit. And this appeared to be based on the the prices of those over the period between 2017 and 2020. So I guess it's a historical or looking back. Now, obviously, the prices of those two items have increased a lot or, or certainly had fluctuated and been very high um, in the last year or two. I'm just wondering, like, how fraught is, is, is it doing these reviews if you are looking backwards? Because you don't quite know what's coming up and ahead of you, do you? Yeah. Um, so there's a balance that has to be struck there because the... Um, those weights are, are very important um, and typically don't change quickly. Although they, I mean, one thing they did do during the pandemic was because international travel just stopped, they did an adjustment for international travel. Uh, but it's quite unusual to adjust them in between um, in between reviews. The fact that they are stable, relatively stable, means that having them more frequently doesn't have a very strong case, but uh, I mean, ideally, I guess you would do it more frequently. Um, 
So more than every three years. So every year or every two years? Yeah. um, uh, I mean, ideally, I suppose you do it every year. But what you do have to be careful about is that there are temporary changes in those weights because, you know, some goods get scarce or um, those kinds of things. And you don't want to change, if, if you immediately change your weightings, then you actually lose the impact on the index of of those price changes. So some stability in them is important. And, um, and it's really that balance between being sensitive to those permanent changes in weightings um, without, without throwing out the information that you that is important about people's uh, uh, substitution of different goods and services for each other in reaction to, to price changes. Just to to sum up, Bill, I'm really interested around your your points about the the household living cost price index and in comparison to the the CPI. I mean, obviously, the CPI, as you you pointed out right at the beginning, it's been around since I think you said 1914. It's changed quite a bit, I think. I mean, according to StatsNZ, it's gone through about four major changes over the years. And obviously, when the Reserve Bank um, inflation targeting regime came in at the end of the 1980s, that's sort of where we got the current version of it or the current version of it started to come in, into place. Um, is, is it still, I mean, is the CPI as it is now, is it, is it still the best it could be for the purposes we use it for? And if that is really just for the Reserve Bank, then should we, I guess, in the media and elsewhere, if we are looking at the inflation impacting on New Zealanders, should we, in fact, be focusing more on the household living cost price index? I think there should be more focus on the the, um, HLPI, the household living cost price index. Um, They they do have different purposes and um, are used in, in somewhat different ways. So... Um, there, there is still. I think there is still a an argument for having both of them, but yeah, I do think that um, the CPI to really live up to its name does need to have interest in it. Um, the uh, which is the main gap really. They do publish CPI plus interest. If you dive down into the tables, they publish every quarter, um, but I, most people wouldn't wouldn't look at that. So. Um, yeah, I think it's really a case of of uh, both, uh, and of um, knowing what each is useful for. Well, look, thanks a lot for that, Bill. It's a, it's an interesting conversation, and as, as I noted, especially in our high inflationary world we're living in today. That's Bill Rosenberg, who is the former policy director and economist at the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions. He's now a commissioner of the New Zealand Productivity Commission and a senior associate at Victoria University's Institute for Governance and Policy Studies. And I'm Gareth Vaughan from interest.co.nz with another episode of our Of Interest podcast.